Oh, nice. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thanks, Gareth. Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Crescent this evening, uh, both to those in the building and to those online. Um, well done, everybody, for coming out on such a beautiful evening. Um, give yourselves a wee pat on the back. <laughs> uh, well done, uh, literal, Tom. Um, so thank you for coming out, and thank you for making the effort uh, to be here and join with us. Um, and thank you to the Rooted crowd for turning up after a busy weekend. Um, I'll hear all the gossip um, later, I'm sure. But well done to the Rooted crowd for, for coming as well. Good to see you. All oh, you all look pretty knackered, to be honest. Um, so we're going to continue our series tonight um, on Easter journeys, and Ryan Wilson will be our speaker. To kick us off, we're going to sing um, Be Thou My Vision, well known. Him, be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me save that thy art. Thou, my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence, my light. The last verse says this, High King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. We're going to stand and sing the words of this wonderful old hymn. Please take your seats. Thank you. That's a good start. Our theme for the songs tonight will be opening our eyes that we'll see Jesus. Um, I'm going to ask my lovely nephew, Alex, to open our service in prayer. If you can still make it after a busy weekend. 
Thank you, Alex. Let's bring this service before the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Lord God and Heavenly Father, we come before you with thankful hearts on this day, this beautiful sunny day, and we come and we offer up our praise to you. Lord, we thank you for the sun that's been shining today and how it's allowed us to marvel at your creation and the things that your hand hath made. Lord, I just pray as we look at this theme of Easter journeys tonight, as we focus our minds on when Christ went to Calvary and what came after that, that this gives us the hope for the future and assurance of our eternal salvation. Lord, I pray for Ryan, that you'll help him to deliver what you've laid in his heart and will be challenged by the message that he has to bring to us. Lord, I thank you for the great weekend that Rooted had away um, in Kilbrony Centre. Lord, I thank you for the wonderful weather you provided and for the chance we were able to have a great fellowship and fun together. But Lord, I thank you most importantly for what we were able to learn by what Stevie Rogers and Ollie shared from the books of Revelation and First Peter. Lord, help that to sink into the hearts of all those who were there and be on their minds going forward throughout the rest of the week that lies ahead. So Lord, we commit this service before you and we um, come before you with thankful hearts. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Alex. Now, I have a few announcements um, to get through, just to make, if you came this morning and hopefully in the way and you maybe got one of these booklets, okay, if you haven't got one, please get one, because this tells you what's happening um, for our 150th anniversary, um, maybe 151 or two, but anyway, it's 150th-ish, um, so we're going to have a, a series of events kicking off next Saturday uh, on the 7th of May, that's the week after. Um, an evening of praise and celebration. So I would encourage everybody to come to that. That's going to be um, a great night of fellowship, of praise and thanksgiving. Um, that weekend we're having a, a special speaker, Chris Wright, uh, coming with, and speaking in the Sundays as, uh, services as well. So please take a booklet. Please pass the booklet on to some friends and family, people who would like to come along to this. It outlines a series of events that are happening, displays, um, looking back over our church history, but looking forward as well um, to what God can and will do through uh, the church fellowship here at Crescent. So please take this booklet, use it, and please come along. And there's a little call for um, action that we need some volunteers for these events. Um, you don't have to be um, especially blessed in the old history um, gift. I, I'm not blessed in history, so um, that's okay. I, can, I qualify. Um, they're looking for volunteers to come along. You'll be highlighted in these days, the Tuesday, Wednesday, um, and Thursdays. Volunteers just come along and be present. Um, so if you're able and willing, um, then please make yourself known to David Farrell or the church office. And then the third part of the 150th anniversary um, announcement um, is that the, um, there'll be invitations handed out in the neighborhood next Sunday. Okay, so please make yourself available um, speak to John Kennedy next Sunday morning, okay? With that in mind, next Sunday morning is the marathon. Uh, so maybe, you know, I'll not be, I, I will be here. Um, <laughs> I'll not be doing the marathon. But that will create a bit of chaos uh, for the travel arrangements. So please look it up online, or if you're stuck, um, speak to the office, and they'll advise you the best route to take to avoid um, the marathon there. Is anybody running the marathon here? No? Is anybody mad enough? No? Andy News not here. No, that's okay. Well, um, please bear that in mind next Sunday uh, when you're coming along, okay? Um, so I said tonight, Ryan is um, continuing on. Um, well, so at the end of our series in the Easter, Easter Journeys, we'll talk about that in a wee moment. Next Sunday morning um, concludes our series in John 3.16, the Golden Text, and David Farrell um, will be speaking uh, next Sunday morning. And that service will be at 11 o'clock. And then next Sunday evening, we are concluding the series in the Easter Journeys, Duncan Lannan. How do you stress there, Ryan? Actually, it's Duncan Lannan's concluding it. A farewell climb. So um, I have another announcement to make. You may see these bits of card at the end. Somebody's actually very colorfully colored this one in for me. Um, these bits of card are for you guys to fill in, OK? And it says at the top, for me, church is blank, OK? and the blanks to be filled in by you. There's no right or wrong answer to this, okay? We would like to get your thoughts on this as part of the 150th celebration. They'll be handed in anonymously. If you sign them, you'll get an elder's visit. Um, 
fill in a non fleet, just leave it in the foyer, and then that'll all be put together for the celebration week um, in, in May that we've been talking about, the 150th. Um, so please leave those, or down in the cafe if you feel more comfortable with that. Now, that's, that's my announcements. Okay, good to know. We're going to sing a few more songs um, and hymns. We're going to focus on the idea of opening our eyes and focusing on the Lord Jesus. We're going to start off with Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. Um, I want to see you. Uh, and we'll move seamlessly through to Open Our Eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. Um, and we'll let the band lead us in that. And yeah, I'll come up after that. Okay. <laughs>
Well done, audience, for knowing the words. Um, that was good. We're just going to pause now um, from our normal service. We're going to take a moment or two just to reflect uh, on the Ukraine uh, situation in Ukraine once again. And with that uh, on our hearts, we're going to ask Rabbi Abraham if he'd come up and pray for Ukraine. Thanks, Rabbi. Let's pray. Our God and our Heavenly Father, we come before you humbly. We acknowledge, Father, that you are the one true God, the great God of this world, the great God of the universe. And Father, we come um, looking at uh, the situation in Ukraine and we see, Father, our helplessness. Um, as we look on, Father, we seek to be able to help. And we turn to you, Father, we turn to you seeking your help, seeking your uh, resolution uh, to this situation. Father, as we look through scriptures, we see that uh, in the midst of um, the scriptures, there are circumstances where rulers have stepped over a line and over a mark. And Lord, you brought Nebuchadnezzar to the situation where he was eating grass and he had to eventually come and acknowledge you as the, the one true God. Lord, we ask that in the midst of this situation, Lord, that this uh, ruler of Russia, that you will, uh, Lord, deal with him. We ask, Father, that you deal with him as you did uh, with Nebuchadnezzar so that he too might acknowledge you as the one true God, that he might realize his folly and his foolishness. Lord, we ask for your help in this situation. We think, um, Lord, as we look on the atrocities, we look on the terrible situation that people, families and, and, and people have found themselves in, Father, that you might um, pour in your mercy and your love into the most awful of situations. Father, we ask that you give wisdom uh, to all those who would be dealing with the political situation, that you will help them to make wise decisions and that these decisions might not be based on human um, uh, help or or um, desire for um, money or fuel or anything else, but purely for uh, the sake of the people that are uh, in distress. Lord, we pray for the believers in Ukraine. We think of uh, those that we know. We think of uh, Tim and Rhoda um, and the situation that they have found themselves in Lutz. We thank you that you've been able to use the church building and so many people have been able to go in and out daily and find refuge and find food and find help. Lord, we pray that you might uh, bless the work that's going on there. And in the midst of such great tragedy and great loss, Father, that people may come to know you as the one true God in their lives, that they may come to know you as Lord and Savior, that they might find the Lord Jesus as the source of their help and their strength. We think in particular of this one man, Pasha, who has turned up and has spent some time there and is uh, possibly seeking you. We pray, Father, that you help um, in that situation and many, many other situations, Lord, where believers in different parts of Ukraine are serving you, staying uh, to uh, present uh, and live out the gospel in the midst of these very difficult situations. We pray for um, the small effort that we as a church are hoping to um, nip out and, and spend some time with um, a refugee camp there. Help us, Father, guide us and direct us and pray that uh, this will be of benefit uh, and of help. And we might too have the opportunity just to share the love of the Lord Jesus as we encounter people, but also to share your gospel uh, with others. We commit uh, all uh, that's going on there and we ask, Father, that you might bring um, a resolution uh, quickly uh, so that there are a uh, few, few lives lost. We pray just as Ray prayed this morning for this power plant in Mariupol and the desperate situation the people are finding themselves in there. We pray, Father, that this might not end in the tragedy that many other folks have found in Mariupol, but soon they might be able to be released uh, from this terrible situation. We commit all of, of these folks to you, and we realize, Father, that we have a responsibility and our greatest responsibility is to bring daily, uh, both personally and corporately, uh, these um, requests to you, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We ask, Father, that you 
uh, focus our eyes on this and that we might realize our responsibility in this regard. We pray all these things in your precious name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Ram. Band are going to come up and play one last song. I, I may have undersold the 7th of May. Um, so, number one, you have to come, or I'm going to be in trouble for not making it big enough. Um, Chris Wright will be doing an epilogue at the end of that service. But there will be a video that there's been two years in the making uh, going to be shown looking at the history of Crescent Church over the last 150 years. And I believe it's a, a really special piece of work. So it's going to be premiered. Uh, it'll be shown later on in the week too, but you really have to come along to see it for the first time on the 7th of May. So please do that. We're going to just um, finish our, our songs tonight um, before Ryan comes and speaks to us. Um, with, uh, there is a hope that burns within my heart that gives me strength for every passing day, a glimpse of glory now revealed in meager part, yet drives all doubt away. I stand in Christ with sins forgiven and Christ in me, the hope of heaven. There is a hope that lifts my weary head, a consolation strong against despair, that when the world has plunged me in its deepest pit, I find my Savior there. Let's stand and sing the words of this wonderful hymn and the truths of it um, with the band leading. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for great singing. Thank you to the band uh, for leading us. Um, that was great. Now I'm going to hand over to Ryan. Ryan's a member here, married to Karis. Both spend their time in dark rooms um, looking at x rays and things, I believe. Although you don't look short in vitamin D tonight. Um, Ryan, it's good to see you. Thank you for your time and preparation. Um, Ryan's title tonight is A Sad Walk Home Taken from Luke 24. So the rest of your time is now over to Ryan. Thank you. Thanks, Nev. Well, thanks very much for coming along in this sunny uh, East, uh, 
April uh, evening. Um, I'm seriously regretting wearing a jumper, I was just saying to Ollie, it's so warm, but um, hopefully we'll make it through. So this evening, um, this is our, the third part in our series considering the journeys around Easter, and this evening we will be considering an encounter with two people that two people have with the risen Lord Jesus while traveling on the road to a village called Emmaus. And our reading is found this evening in Luke chapter 24, and we'll read from verses 13 to 35. Just as you're looking that up, um, interestingly, Luke is the only gospel writer to record these events and this encounter. In fact, he centers his whole account of the resurrection on this uh, encounter with these two uh, companions on the road. And as we read the passage, I would encourage you to consider and think why it is you think it is that Luke has chosen to do this. So let's read Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some of the women of our com company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and they did not find his body. They came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said. But him we did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted, he acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us, for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and give it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while, we, while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord had, has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told them, then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. I wonder if you've ever lost confidence in the gospel. Maybe there was a time where you were once walking closely with God, you had a real sense of his presence and felt confident submitting to his will for your life. But something happened that made you question if the Lord really knows what he's doing. Maybe it was the death of a loved one the breakdown of a relationship, maybe it was an illness or having to come to terms with the reality that you wouldn't be able to start a family. Whenever something like that happens, it's possible to find yourself feeling like God is asleep at the wheel or that he's somehow got it wrong. Encountering things like this can lead people to sometimes give up and walk away from their faith or alternatively, it can result in our hearts becoming cold towards the Lord. Well, if you've ever felt like that, you probably can relate to these two companions on the road to Emmaus. 
They had been confident followers of the Lord Jesus and closely associated with the inner circle of disciples. It would have been just one week uh, since these two people had joined the large jubilant crowd of followers as they escorted Jesus into Jerusalem with much acclamation. At that time, they would have had great expectations for what the Lord would have done. They had hoped that he would be the Messiah, the new anointed king of Israel who would defeat the Romans and liberate the Jews. But even before the popular uprising could get started or gain traction in Jerusalem, the Messiah seemingly had misstepped. He had been captured by the Jews, by the Jewish authorities, and they'd handed him over to the Romans who had crucified him. One week earlier, these two companions had been riding a wave of jubilant expectation for what the Lord could have done, but now it seemed that their hopes had been shipwrecked. Our companions would have spent the past couple of days also in an upper room behind a firmly bloated door for fear of what the Jewish authorities would have done to them for being a follower of Jesus. And scrambling to make sense of the events, they came to the conclusion that it was over. And and Jerusalem was a dangerous place to be. They had expected to reign with Jesus, not to die with him. They had accompanied Jesus to Jerusalem with the hope that he was the Messiah. But now he had been killed, so they'd given up on that hope and decided to walk the seven or so miles back to Emmaus, back home. And as they regressed down that road, they came, they had come up just one week earlier. They did so with heavy hearts, disillusioned, disappointed for what could have been. But that was before they met the Lord Jesus on the road. You know, it's interesting to think how the Lord Jesus chose to spend those 40 days between his his resurrection and his ascension, isn't it? He chose to spend that time appearing to and restoring his followers. Like a good shepherd, we read of him going after and gathering back together his flock. Think of Mary weeping at the tomb or Peter beside a charcoal fire on the shore of Galilee. Each interaction was unique to that person's need and shaped by their relationship with the Lord. And so with these two dear disciples, the Lord Jesus wasn't willing to let them disappear back down that road and over the hill, blinded by their grief. He went after them to bring them back. And the main question that we'll be asking ourselves this evening is how he would do that. We will ask what our two companions' problem was, what was the Lord's solution to their problem, and finally, what was their response? So what was the problem? Well, as the companions walked back home down that road, the risen Lord Jesus draws near to them, although they don't recognize him. Overhearing them discuss and try to make sense of the events of the past few days, he asks them what what it is that they're talking about. We're told they just stood there looking sad. It almost seems as if they've reached the fourth stage of their grief. After acceptance, they now seemed a bit depressed. But Jesus walks alongside with them, asking them questions and drawing out from them what their problem was. They said, Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Notice the past tense when they say we had hoped that he would redeem us. Their hope in the Lord Jesus had been relegated to a thing of the past. As you sit here this evening, can I ask you the question, what's the status of your hope in the Lord Jesus? Is it alive and well? Or has it been relegated to the past? 
you get a real, I, I, whenever you look at verse 24, you can get a real sense of Luke's irony whenever he tells us. Looking Jesus in the face, they say, some of us have even been to see the empty tomb, but we haven't seen him. As they look, there isn't Lord Jesus in the face. Now, at this point, you might be asking why the Lord Jesus did not simply reveal himself to the disciples. Well, if the Lord had revealed his identity to them, it would have certainly convinced them that he had risen from the dead, but it would not have necessarily dealt with the core problem, their core problem. The problem with our two companions was that their understanding of God's plan of redemption was all wrong. They misunderstood what had happened at the cross. For them, the Messiah's suffering and death had equaled failure and defeat. This misunderstanding had caused them to lose confidence in him and his message. They didn't understand the role that pain and suffering and death had to play in God's eternal plan of salvation. They didn't really understand the gospel or the implications of the cross. Even if they did accept the resurrection, their faulty thinking, thinking would have left them very vulnerable to feeling defeated and losing confidence in the Lord whenever they experienced any kind of suffering or hardship in their own lives. So we thought that their thinking was faulty and they didn't really understand the gospel, but what was the Lord's solution? What was the Lord's strategy to restore these two disillusioned disciples who had lost their confidence in him and his gospel? What was it that would restore their hope in him and cause their hearts to once again burn within them? Well, having listened, the Lord responds to them with a stern rebuke. He says he rebukes them and says, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe that the prophets, what the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then to enter into his glory? And with that, he opens the Old Testament scriptures to them, revealing the cross, that the, revealing that the cross, what appeared so chaotic and final to them, was actually the central part of God's eternal plan. What an experience that must have been. Imagine listening to God's plan to redeem creation by the very author of creation itself. Some people have called it the greatest sermon never recorded. Details of the sermon are minimal, uh, other than being told, beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. We're forced to imagine the Lord maybe taking them to Exodus 12, and explaining that the spotless lamb at the Passover spoke of his own blood spilt to atone for the sins of the world, or drawing the stark comparison between the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 and his own broken body at Calvary, or why in Psalm 22 the, the Savior had to be forsaken for our sake. But as they walked and listened, like a key slowly turning in a lock, slowly the pieces started to fall into place. The eyes of their understanding began to open. And as their understanding grew, they could see that maybe the Messiah did need to die, like the scriptures had said. And they allowed hope to once again flicker into flame within their hearts. Sensing that this was no ordinary traveler, but someone who spoke with real authority, they urged him to come and stay with them rather, rather than to continue on on their journey. They didn't want the sermon to end. A bit like I imagine how you all must be feeling right now. But as he broke the bread and gave thanks for it, the lock sprang open and they realized that their companion on the road was indeed the risen Lord Jesus. That could mean only one thing. It was all true. He was the Messiah. He was not an incompetent failure, 
but died, yes, he died, yes. But he died for our sins, according to the scripture. He was buried, and now he was raised back to life, according to the scriptures. The Lord Jesus knew that his two dear disciples didn't need some supernatural or overwhelming emotional experience. Their problem was that their understanding of God's plan to redeem Israel was too simplistic. They needed a fuller understanding of God's plan of redemption as revealed in the scriptures. In particular, the Lord knew that they needed to have a meaningful understanding of the logic of the cross if they were to be confident and resilient agents of the gospel. The suffering and death that these disciples witnessed at the cross was not chaotic and final as they thought that it, ha- it was. But rather, at the cross, God in his wisdom goes through suffering and death in order to defeat death and deal with the problem of suffering. On faith value, the cross defies and confounds human logic, doesn't it? But when we truly understand it, we realize that its message is so much more compelling than anything that we could have ever made up. In his suffering on the cross, Jesus also deals with the problem of suffering in our own lives. John Stott once said, I could never myself believe in God if it were not for the cross. The only God I believe in is the one Nietzsche ridiculed as God on the cross. He goes on, that is the God for me. He laid aside his immunity to pain. He entered our world of flesh and blood, tears and death. He suffered for us. Our sufferings become more manageable in the light of his. The Christian life, likewise, on face value, defies human logic. To some, it can seem like failure rather than triumph and victory. We too must go down before we're able to go up. We must give up our lives if we want to save our lives. We must deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow the Lord Jesus. But as the Lord reminds his disciples earlier in Luke chapter nine, what good is it if someone gain the whole world and yet lose their very self? So what was the response of our two uh, companions? Well, like the aha moment in the final chapter of an Agatha Christie novel, or the big reveal at the end of uh, Death of Paradise, personal favorite of ours, everything now made sense to our two companions. And that very night, they returned to Jerusalem and told the other disciples all that had happened. The first time that they'd made that journey, they did so hoping that Jesus would turn out to be the Messiah and liberate them from the Romans. But now they knew that he was the Messiah. And the scope of his deliverance was so much bigger. He had come to defeat death itself and to liberate us from the penalty of sin. And their fuller knowledge of God's plan of redemption as revealed in the scriptures and the role of the events of the cross and their understanding that the role of the events of the cross had to play in that plan had now made them more confident and resilient agents of the gospel. So in conclusion, I'd just like to ask us two questions. So what do we do whenever we lose confidence in the gospel? Maybe like these two companions, our understanding of the gospel is too simplistic and we need a deeper understanding of it. We get this by steady exposure to good Bible teaching, by staying plugged into God's word. Maybe you could commit to a Bible reading plan. It doesn't need to be anything 
too intense to start with, certainly. Maybe it could just be a psalm in the morning before you go to work. And while we may not have the Son of God physically beside us, walking beside us, as Christians, we do have the Spirit of God dwelling within us. Each time you sit down to listen to a sermon or you read that psalm before you go to work, why not ask the Spirit of God to open the eyes of your understanding and to apply his word to your heart and to your life? And let me just close by asking again, what is the status of your hope in the Lord Jesus? Is it alive and well? Or is it at risk of being relegated to the past? Maybe you need a renewed appreciation of the logic of the cross, that to go, down, to go up, we must first go down. That what might appear chaotic and final to us is all part of God's plan for our lives. And then in our light momentary afflictions, as we read in Corinthians, he is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So let's just uh, close in a word of prayer. Our Father, as we think of these two companions on the road to Emmaus, they were at risk of giving up their hope in you. We know, Lord, that that was because their understanding of the events at the cross were all wrong. And they didn't understand the logic or the role that pain and suffering had to, t had to pay in God's plan of salvation and redemption. We thank you, Lord, for the cross. We thank you, Lord, that it does defy human logic. But in your wisdom, you used suffering and death to defeat death and to deal with the problem of suffering in our own lives. We pray, Lord, that you would open the eyes of our understanding and that you would apply your word to our hearts this evening. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Ryan, for taking us through um, the wonderful story of Luke 24. Um, Christ died on the cross for our sins. We thank him for that. But we thank God for the empty tomb. He has risen. And he's risen indeed. And our heart's response to that should be one of thanksgiving and praise, especially around Easter time. But uh, any day will do. We're going to sing, My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who pour, bore my pain who plumbed the depths of my disgrace and gave me life again. My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who walks beside, who floods my weaknesses with strength and causes fear to fly. My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who reigns above, whose wisdom is my perfect peace, whose every thought is love. Our heart's response for every day I have on earth is given by the king, so I will give my life, my all, to love and follow him. Let's worship him and give thanks as we sing the words um, of this uh, hymn. Once we've sung this, our service is over. Thank you for coming. <laughs>